Welcome to the U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you by the members of the National Farmers Organization of this local area. Every American can profit by the successful NFO collective bargaining program for agriculture. For farm income sets the nation's prosperity. U.S. Farm Report presents a look at agriculture and the economy with some of the top leaders at our nation's capital. Appearing on today's program to discuss agricultural affairs and issues are Senator Walter Mondale of Minnesota, former Minnesota Attorney General, who succeeded the Hubert Humphrey seat in the Senate when Humphrey became Vice President, and Senator George McGovern of South Dakota, a congressman in the 50s and special assistant to President Kennedy and Food for Peace Director in 1961-62 until he resigned to make his successful campaign for the Senate. Both Senator Mondale and Senator McGovern are members of the Senate Agriculture Committee, and they have teamed up in that committee to work for passage of wheat, feed grain, dairy, parity price and income, and food for freedom legislation. They have been asked to discuss today where farmers stand, the outlook, the legislative issues, of continuing importance to farmers, as well as food and fiber problems of consumers in America. Well, George, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today and to talk about what I regard as one of the most important questions before Americans today. And that's uh, the position of the American family farmer who's done so much for this country. Uh, how we're coming on our objective of full parity for the American family farmer, and how well we're doing in structuring programs to permit the farmer to do his share to work toward the peace. And I don't know of any person who's providing more leadership on this issue than you are, uh, George, and I'm delighted to have this chance to step back from some of our day-to-day -day work on the Agriculture Committee to, in a sense, take a look at this bigger picture. Well, let me just say, uh, Walter, that uh, it's always a, a special pleasure, as far as I'm concerned, to discuss uh, the problems of agriculture with you. I uh, can't think of anything that's happened in, in recent years that has brought me any more personal satisfaction than your coming to the United States Senate, and more particularly, your uh, place on the Senate Committee on Agriculture. There are some people who feel that at a time when the farmer as a small, represents a smaller percentage of our population than he did in years gone by, that agriculture has lost some of its uh, significance. But you know, and, and uh, many of us know, that uh, agriculture has never been more fundamental to the life of our country and to the life of the world uh, than it is today. So it's given me great uh, satisfaction as one uh, concerned about the uh, position of Midwest agriculture in particular that we have another strong voice on the uh, Agricultural Committee and you take the place of uh, former uh, Senator Humphrey, now uh, Vice President Humphrey, on that uh, committee uh, and to work for the uh, cause of the uh, Midwest farmer and the farmer as a whole. I think uh, those of us on the committee were particularly impressed with your leadership in saving the feed grain program and strengthening that program a year ago. It's my own judgment that uh, without your leadership and without your voice on that question, we would have lost the, uh, the feed grain program uh, a year ago. It so happened that the chairman of our committee, for various reasons, was opposed to the program and wanted to end it or at least very seriously uh, reduce it. But you brought him around and brought a lot of other people around on the committee to uh, support the program, and we're grateful to you. Well, as you know, George, uh, the feed grain program is uh, fundamental to the farm economy of our state. Uh, three out of every five dollars that the Minnesota farmer earns is uh, the direct or indirect results of feed grain production. And thus, it, uh, in my opinion, was essential that we sustain our, uh, I think, quite successful feed grain program and build on what we had. And I regarded this as a basic fight uh, necessary for the long-term improvement of the farm picture in our state. Well, I think it's important, uh, Walter, not only because of the uh, direct income that good uh, feed grain prices mean to the uh, producers of grain, uh, but also because this is really the economic foundation of our livestock and That's hog right. and, and poultry uh, industry. Right. 
uh, if you destroy the feed grain uh, price structure, sooner or later we're in trouble in our whole uh, livestock uh, economy. I think, too, you, the, uh, the leadership that you've provided in the uh, committee and on the floor in uh, legislation to improve our dairy uh, uh, price situation, uh, your efforts to uh, knock down some of the phony uh, barriers, uh, so-called sanitary uh, barriers on the uh, use of uh, Minnesota milk and South Dakota milk and some of the other uh, markets, your concern about uh, adequate uh, food reserves and setting up uh, commodity reserves as provided in the uh, legislation that you have uh, sponsored. All of these, it seems to me, are, are helpful initiatives. Well, George, I think you're being a little modest about your role. Uh, uh, I regard you as the top spokesman for the American Family Farmer on our Senate Farm Committee and on the Senate floor. Uh, I think your background and experience uh, as the Food for Peace director uh, under President Kennedy has given you an experience and a wealth of understanding that uh, surely in these past few days when we've been dealing with Food for Freedom has been absolutely indispensable. And your leadership in uh, the wheat and the other voluntary uh, uh, programs that uh, we've enacted in the four-year program that we adopted last year, I think was indispensable. And without it, uh, we simply wouldn't have had the kind of program that, that we now have. And uh, I'm very grateful that uh, when I came on this committee as a newcomer, I had uh, someone from the Midwest uh, uh, in your person to help and advise me, and uh, I'm very grateful for this. I think that uh, we could probably summarize uh, uh, the present situation by saying that the farmer is doing better, but not nearly well enough. Well, I think I think we've made uh, we've made uh, progress, uh, Walter. There there are a good many uh, problems that still yes. plague uh, uh, Amer American uh, agriculture. But I have uh, a great deal of optimism about the uh, future. I think that for the first time since I've been in the Congress, uh, that we're on the threshold of a day when agriculture can move into a real period of uh, prosperity. The uh, difficulties of other countries in meeting their own uh, production needs uh, is a very uh, painful uh, difficulty, but it's one that provides a great challenge and also a great opportunity for us. And I think we're beginning to make some progress towards greater stability for our own producers. In the, uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, I think we can uh, feel good about the fact that net farm income uh, this year is up about $3.5 billion over uh, six years ago. Uh, but we're only at 80% of parity, and that surely isn't uh, anything to uh, make us feel uh, totally satisfied. But I think in addition to this, we uh, ought to place great significance, because it is truly important in the, in the problem of farm economics, that we finally cleared the surpluses. We've spent uh, nearly five and a half years uh, trying to rid ourselves of crushing burdens. Uh, in 1960, we had, I think, 1.4 billion bushels of wheat in, in surplus. That's correct. Uh, 85 million tons of corn in surplus. Uh, vast quantities of uh, uh, dairy products in surplus. Cotton and tobacco, practically every commodity that uh, was in any related way related to federal programs was uh, found in vast surplus quantities, and one of the biggest business in American agriculture was storage. We had an inventory of somewhere around $9 billion in, in surplus uh, commodities at that time, five or six years ago. And I think it's just a fundamental mm -hmm. fact of American farm life that surpluses depress prices, no matter how the federal government tries to hold them off the market. They're there, the uh, trade is conscious of it, and it weakens and softens the market. And today, We've cleared those surpluses. One of the, one of the really uh, remarkable developments that's taken place, and it's happened so quietly that few people are aware of it, is that we no longer have a surplus in this country. With the exception of cotton and tobacco, which we can't eat, uh, we have almost uh, no surplus at all. Now, we have a, a reserve, uh, I would say a strategic reserve, of wheat, of uh, feed grains, of some other uh, commodities, but there's no uh, food crop or no feed crop uh, that we have in excessive uh, supply today. What we do have is an excess of empty stomachs in the world, and that excess is increasing uh, much faster than the ability of the world to uh, feed itself. I think for the uh, first time, at least uh, 
uh, in our lifetimes, the, uh, the world is in real danger of running out of food, of being able to uh, meet the needs of the fast-growing populations of these uh, developing countries. We're told that before the end of this century, which isn't very far away, some 34 years, that we'll have at least twice as many uh, hungry stomachs on this planet as we do today, twice as many people as we do today. Now that's going to place an enormous challenge on the, uh, on the American farmer because we're one of the few areas in the world that has unused land, that has unused uh, production uh, potential that we can quickly tap and that has the know-how to meet that need. I think this is uh, almost an inestimable uh, opportunity for American agriculture. It means new income for the farmers of America. It means new production opportunities. But it's going to take the best brains of all of us to devise the kind of a program that will enable us to utilize that opportunity. Well, George, you've provided uh, the leadership in the Congress on this issue. And it's now been incorporated in what we call the Food for Freedom Bill. And I think you put your finger on it. We're in the midst of a world population explosion. Um, I, I saw a figure the other day that up until the year 1600, the world's population increased by 3% every century. Today, it's increasing by 3% every year. And except for North America and Australia and New Zealand, most of the world is now in a what you call a food deficient status. They, they don't have enough food to food, feed their own people. And it's usually the same areas that are food deficient that are so poor that they can't afford to buy it. Uh, and thus, uh, we are in the position where we, by acting or failing to act, we can prevent the starvation of millions or cause the starvation of millions. And it's just that simple as a question of what we're going to do about it. And of course, that's what we're involved in now in our Food for Freedom program, to try to use America's fantastic family farm productive system to produce enough food to prevent starvation, or at least our share of that food, and at the same time try to encourage these countries and lead them into uh, uh, taking those steps that will get their own agricultural house in order and take some steps in other areas as well. That's basically what we're up to as I understand it. Well, that's, uh, that's correct, and I, I think uh, what we have to recognize is, is that we've moved into a new situation now. We're no longer talking that's about right. using surpluses. We're talking about what we need to do with our domestic farm program to gear it up to meet the needs of, of a hungry world. We're now uh, devoting approximately uh, $1.5 billion dollars in government funds to pay our farmers not to produce on some uh, 60 million acres of idle land. For very little more money than that, we could bring that production, that, that idle land back into production, buy the commodities at uh, market prices, and use them overseas in, uh, in food uh, deficit areas. And this is really what the so-called Food for Freedom Bill that we're now working on is all about. And I think there's another important point here uh, that, that you've touched on, and that is that we're now in a different era. When we first passed the Food for Peace Bill, and when you were administering it under President Kennedy, we were really taking uh, surplus stocks found in government storage. Now those surpluses are clear. They're not there. So if we're going to help these people in these backward areas uh, prevent starvation and get their own agriculture moving, we've actually got to go out into the market and buy uh, the production of our American family farmers. So that for the first time, the farmer is going to get a direct dollar advantage out of this Food for Freedom program. And secondly, if we expand production as we must, as you've just pointed out on these idle acres, it means that the local communities are going to have money for, uh, unlike uh, the money they do not get from idle acres, they're going to have money for fuel oil, for tractors, for feed and seed and fertilizers, and, uh, and uh, this is going to contribute to the vitality of the hometown. Uh, unlike uh, the idling of acreage. Well, there's no, uh, no question about that. I, I think that one of the uh, principal anxieties of our rural communities, now I'm not speaking just to farmers alone. Yeah. I'm talking about the man who runs a gas station or a barber shop or a feed store or an implement store in the smaller uh, rural uh, communities. One of their principal concerns has been the drag on business that stems from the idling of acres. Idle acres uh, means idle labor. 
It means tractors that you don't sell. It means uh, supplies of all kinds that are not uh, consumed and that pile up in the stores and the business places. So as we bring these idle acres back into uh, production, we're not only adding to the income of the farmer, but we're putting that farmer back into production when he becomes a full uh, purchasing uh, customer of the things that are sold on the main streets of our towns all across uh, rural America. So I see this program as one of uh, great stimulus to our economy as a whole. I, I think we have to be sure here, as you pointed out so many times in the committee, that as we expand this uh, acreage and expand American agriculture production, that we do two things. First of all, that we don't develop surpluses again with this we have to be I very we careful won't make that mistake again. and secondly i think the american family farmer is entitled uh to get a decent return for this added production and sometimes world prices do not provide that uh, that uh, basic return that he needs for a decent return and i was glad to see your leadership on this uh wheat export certificate uh, uh, program because i think this is an indispensable part of, uh, of if we're going to have a decent return for our farmers Along that same line, uh, uh, Walter, your uh, efforts to uh, secure, the, uh, to raise the resale uh, price yeah. of government-held uh, grain, I think, can be uh, be very helpful. You've suggested that that be at a minimum of 115 yeah. percent of the of the loan price. I think that would add uh, millions of dollars to the uh, income of the farmer, and would prevent. Uh, the accumulation of uh, commodities to overhang the market in a depressing uh, way. So you're quite uh, correct that we do have to take those uh, steps. Uh, another thing I think we need to keep our uh, eye on is that this program needs to be used not as a uh, permanent uh, concessional arrangement to feed uh, hungry uh, people, but as a market development uh, tool. Uh, we've found in, in the past that as these countries increase their per capita income, even though it's a small increase, a few dollars a month uh, per capita, a few dollars a year, that they make rather remarkable increases yeah. in their cash uh, purchases of the things that we have to uh, sell. The Department of Agriculture did a study of some 34 developing countries, and they found that for every dollar that they uh, increase their per capita income, they spend another uh, uh, $2 on uh, uh, commercial uh, purchases abroad. I can recall that when the Food for Peace program was first adopted and started operating, one of the complaints heard in some quarters was that this would compete with American dollar sales. And uh, since the beginning of the program, I think some 13 billions of dollars in American food uh, has gone overseas. And actually, at the same time, our cash markets have risen. And, in, and uh, some of the countries that were once Food for Peace recipients are now huge cash, cash purchasers of American farm products. Japan, for example, which once received our Food for Peace free, is now, uh, I think, purchasing American farm products for cash in the, at the tune of nearly a billion dollars a year. So that as we contribute to the prosperity of these countries and get them on their own feet, they, they soon become, or uh, some of them have soon become, uh, cash purchasers of American farm products. Well, Walter, that's been the pattern in one country after another. Japan, of course, is, as you say, is a classic example, but Italy and Spain and Greece, and Formosa, a good many other countries that were once receiving food from us on a grant basis are now buying it for hard cash and providing us with markets that we desperately need. I think it might be well for us to turn to a different subject that I hear discussed by our farmers and I think uh, uh, should be discussed here and something that I think our consumers should understand and that's the relationship between uh, the price paid to the American farmer for farm production and consumer prices. Uh, I think uh, every farmer in my state and I'm sure it's true in your state is grateful for your leadership in this field. The McGovern resolution, which I was proud to support, that declared at the sense of the Congress that no federal agency should take any step to depress sub-parity farm prices, and which passed unanimously in the United States Senate, uh, with you as its floor leader, I think it expresses the feeling of so many of us that, that until we get the American farmer up to a parity status, so that he's getting the same return for his efforts and on his investment as others, the federal government ought not to be resorting to efforts to depress those prices. Indeed, they ought to be uh, fulfilling uh, what, after all, has been the declared objective of this administration, full parity for the American farmer. 
And I think we might discuss this uh, fact a little bit. Well, uh, Walter, I, I happen to believe that uh, parody is not uh, outmoded. There are some people that uh, seem to be a little bit embarrassed to talk about parody for farmers. There doesn't seem to me to be anything old-fashioned about that at all. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, I think that's uh, fundamental. And there's nothing complicated about parody. It's simply another word for a fair price. It uh, simply means that when the price of everything else goes up, price of automobiles and shoes and and uh, the things that we uh, consume uh, in the industrial world, when those prices go up, that farm prices ought to go up with them. Farmers not asking for any, any kind of a subsidy or any kind of an unfair uh, concession that isn't available to every other citizen in the economy. And what we tried to do with the uh, parity resolution that uh, you supported so effectively and, and talked for so uh, energetically uh, from the very uh, day you've arrived here in Washington and before that, is to make sure that no agency of the government, not just the Secretary of Agriculture, but no agency of the government uses their power to drive down or to freeze any farm price that is below parity. In other words, that's at an unfair uh, level. And that's the reason this resolution was needed, to prevent actions of the kind that the Secretary of Commerce took when he said we shouldn't export our livestock hides because uh, that might uh, raise the price of shoes uh, here in the stop. United States. Yes, and uh, after they imposed the restrictions, the price of shoes went up and the price of hides went down. Of course. Uh, so once again, the farmer was uh, caught uh, holding the bag, so to speak. One of the one of the false ideas that uh, that a good many people have is that the price of the food, or the shirt, or the shoes that we uh, buy in the store is determined largely by farm price. This this point has to be made clear to our American consumers. Um, in our report out of our committee in support of your resolution, uh, we had some figures, and I think it might be a good idea to just go over them because I think they're very very revealing to show that there's a very slight relationship between improved farm income on the one hand and higher consumer costs on the other. This showed that in 1947, the food cost of the American consumers took 25.7% of their disposable income. But out of that 25.7%, the American farmer got less than half of it. Only 11% of the disposable income of the consumers in 1947 went to the American farmer. In 1965, last year, food co cost to our consumers was only 18.2% of their disposable farm income. In other words, it went down 7.5% mm -hmm. in 20 years. And I think we can stop right here and say that one of the things that the American family farmer has done for Americans is to feed them at a lower cost than any other people in the world. Now, only 18.2% of their budget. But the farmer only gets 5.3% of the 18% that the Americans spend on food. So that the farmer who works from dawn to dusk to, pr to provide the cereals and the meat and the poultry and the eggs and the butter that contributes to our high standard of living and these remarkably, this remarkably low percentage of our budget that goes toward food only gets 6% of that dollar that's disposed for that purpose. And our report further went on and said that if the farmer got 100% of parity for everything he produced, the farmer's uh, share of that disposable dollar would go up to only about 7%. Seven so that if the farmer were to get a full and 100% return of parity for his efforts, the impact on on the American economy but would be very negligible indeed. Well, you'll remember when we were trying to get the uh, wheat certificate plan through that uh, some of the people who were sharpshooting at that uh, proposal were arguing that giving farmers a fair price for their wheat uh, was some kind of a bread tax on consumers as though the two or two and a half cents uh, uh, that the farmer gets for the wheat and a loaf of bread determine the cost that the uh, housewife pays uh, at the checkout counter in her, uh, in her supermarket. We know that the wax uh, wrapper on that uh, bread, which is usually gaily and attractively uh, printed, uh, costs as much as the wheat uh, that made the, uh, the loaf of bread. So the farmer's part is a, a very small uh, part of the total. One of the things that uh, has irritated me somewhat here just in, in recent days is what's happened in our milk 
uh, situation. The Secretary of Agriculture put through a very modest uh, increase, uh, 50 cents a hundredweight on milk here um, recently, which would give the farmer somewhere around a half a cent a quart more for the milk that he uh, produces. And yet we've had reports of some uh, uh, retailers raising uh, milk prices as much as uh, two and a half cents a quart. So they, they uh, come to the farmer and say, well, what are you doing with this two and a half cents? Actually, he's only getting, as you point out, barely one half cent increase. And uh, it should be recognized that in Minnesota, I think the dairy farmer gets about 60 cents an hour for his efforts. Mm -hmm. So this is important minimal improvement, this $4 a hundredweight uh, uh, minimum. And some of us are trying to uh, uh, encourage new legislation to uh, encourage production because recently in Minnesota we've been losing about 12 dairy farmers a day. It just isn't worth the effort, uh, some feel, and uh, we're trying to get that return up there in the interests of the consumer. One of the things that uh, I think is disturbing about this liquidation of our dairy herds is that it takes a considerable period of That's time right. to uh, build a good dairy herd. It takes a considerable amount of capital to get uh, started. I'm concerned about the uh, loss of these uh, dairy farms all over the, uh, right. the Midwest because I think at a time when uh, we're taking on new responsibilities in the world to deal with this problem of hunger, when there's such an urgent need for milk, dairy products, and other uh, high-protein foods, that we're putting ourselves in a very dangerous situation to lose these uh, valuable foundation uh, herds. Uh, what that means is that just at the time when the demands on us are the greatest, well, we're losing some of the essential suppliers in the uh, war on hunger. In my judgment, that war on hunger uh, is the kind of war that we ought to be fighting. It not only means new prosperity for our uh, farm producers here on ho at home, but it opens the way for the conditions that might uh, permit peace to uh, reign in the world someday. Well, George, I've enjoyed uh, discussing these fundamental issues of American farm economics and the role of the American farmer in helping to work toward peace. I think this is the kind of discussion that we ought to have more of because far more understanding is needed of what we're trying to do and uh, the validity of our objectives. And uh, no person has contributed more to this struggle than you have. And I'm very pleased to uh, be with you on this program. Well, thank you so much, uh, Walter. And I look forward to working with you on American agricultural uh, uh, programs and our opportunities abroad in the years ahead. Thank you very much. U.S. Farm Report has presented a look at agriculture with some of the top leaders from our nation's capital. The U.S. Congress could foresee today's farm problems years ago when they passed the Capra-Volstead Act in 1922. This is one of the greatest gifts that Congress has granted to the farmer. It gives the farmer the same legal right to bargain collectively that is already enjoyed by every other segment of our economy. The National Farmers Organization was organized and operates under the Capra-Volstead Act. The NFO collective bargaining power is being developed at the marketplace for the purpose of obtaining realistic farm prices. Every American can profit by the successful NFO collective bargaining for agriculture, the economic keystone of America. The U.S. Farm Report has been brought to you by the members of the National Farmers Organization in this area.